This is a really fun subject. Connective tissue. Mm -hmm. So fun. All right. So you may have heard about connective tissue. It's gotten a lot of play in the last, it's gotten a lot of air time in the last um, 10, 15 years. See, the thing is, is like scientists, anatomists, used to go in, you know, cut up dead bodies and things like that. And they'd be like, and they'd cut away all of the connective tissue and be like, let's get to the good stuff. Let's get to the muscles. Let's get to what's really important in the body. So for years and years, connective tissue was just kind of tossed out. It'd be like, nobody cares about connective tissue. But now, people are starting to realize how important the role of connective tissue is in the body, not only in functional movement, but even some people who study connective tissue are like, wow, this is really important in your body's communication. It's really important actually like transmitting emotion or maybe even consciousness, like people are really excited about it. So today as we start to explore the different kinds of connective tissue in your body, we'll start to see how it really, it really holds your whole self together. So there are a few systems in the body which are like whole body systems, like your nervous system, you have nerves everywhere, your cardiovascular system, you've got capillaries everywhere through your body, your connective tissue. So if you removed everything in your body except for your connective tissue and then we stood Jen up, we'd be like, oh, that's Jen. She looks a little like a vampire. She looks a little pale, but that's, you recognize her because it's so, it's such a whole body continuum. So we're gonna dig a little bit more into the kind of connective tissue that you find in your body today. So we're gonna look at connective tissue and we're going to specifically look at connective tissue proper. So in the body, there are, there are four kinds of tissues, very broadly speaking. One is connective tissue, nervous tissue, epithelial, which is like skin and glands and linings of things, and then muscles. Right, so uh, think about muscles, nervous system, glands, lining, skin stuff. Take all that out and the rest that you have is connective tissue. So connective tissue, can anybody think of kind of connective, when you think of connective tissue, that term, kind of like what's stuff that you might think of? Fascia. 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 Whenever I hear fascia, I always think Luke. I am your fascia. It's like I was just like a Star Wars, Star Trek, Star Wars. Oh my gosh, what a terrible mistake to make. Yeah. Star Wars moment. Sorry, friends. I'm a nerd in both directions. All right. Okay. So fascia. What else? Tendons. Tendons. Yes. What else? Good. Anything else? Ligaments. 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 Yes. Good. Yeah, so, and fat is a connective, considered a connective tissue. Other things that actually fall, the umbrella of connective tissue is quite big. So other structures that fall under connective tissue are actually your bones, cartilage, your blood, your lymph. So, I mean, that's a big umbrella, but those are considered connective tissue. And then what we're gonna look at more specifically today is what kind of falls into the property of something called connective tissue proper. So the purpose of connective tissue, as we've kind of looked at this big umbrella term, is to really connect all of the parts into a whole and to form the matrix in which we can live and function. So it's structure and support. And like you think of your bones, like yesterday we talked about bones and we talked a bit about cartilage, it's providing structure, support, and form for our body. So that's the purpose of connective tissue as a big umbrella. And then for um, types of connective tissue, we can break down connective tissue into sort of three kind of big categories. One would be something called supportive connective tissue. One would be called fluid connective tissue. And then we'll look at connective tissue proper. This is just a, a way for us to kind of understand the different kinds of stuff that might fall into this bigger umbrella. So supportive connective tissue is stuff like your bones and joints. Liquid connective tissue would be on the other end of the spectrum, like blood and lymph and the stuff that surrounds your cells. Because remember, you are a fluidy creature and all your cells are surrounded by this something like ground substance or the extracellular matrix. Basically, it's the stuff that your cells float in so that they can like, you know, transmit nutrients and things like that with its external environment. And then we have connective tissue proper, which will be our focus. So what connective tissue isn't? Muscles, nerves, and epithelial. I mean, that blew my mind. I was like, what bones? You consider bones connective tissue? Blood is connective tissue? Yeah. Yes. Why is blood considered a connective tissue? 
Well, it helps form the matrix in which everything survives, right? So it's not a muscle. I, I kind of go, well, what's, it's, it almost feels like connective tissue is kind of like the and everything else category, you know? Like, and it has to do too with um, how cells form when you're, like when you're an embryo too. So it has to do with how those things develop. All right, so do you guys want to hear, um, actually, no, we're not going to, that is way too, I can't even handle how nerdy that is. All right, so let's look at the three types. Supportive connective tissue, we've already talked about bones and joints, right? So structures, what are some of the reasons that we have bones? We mentioned it yesterday. Protection. Protection, what else? Structure. Structure. Movement. Movement, yeah, support all of those things. Um, Fluid connective tissue. What's the function of this kind of fluid connective tissue? What does like what does blood do, for example? Transport. Yeah, it's moving stuff around. Right, nutrients and things like that. Lymph. Anybody familiar with lymph? Nope. <laughs> nope. Don't worry. That's covered in. We'll cover this more in the cardiovascular module. But lymph is part of the immune system. Yeah, it moves that extracellular matrix. So all the stuff, all the fluid that surrounds your cells, basically when that enters your lymphatic system, it gets kind of cleaned out of bacteria and stuff like that. So the function of lymph really is, I guess, to, to clean you up. It's like your, your, the, the garbage men of your system, they go around and they take care of business. Um, and the extracellular matrix, which is basically all the fluid surrounding your cells, that's also um, a site for exchange Right? With all of your, um, with all of, with what you need basically to survive. Here's an, here's an artist rendering of the extracellular matrix. Okay. So our focus as movement specialists is going to be connective tissue proper. So that includes things, things like fascia, ligaments, and tendons. So connective tissue proper, um, basically if we think about our muscles, and you think about your organs, they're kind of like pudding. And so there has to be something that holds all that stuff together. And that's the role of your fascia. So fascia is kind of like the container for your pudding that holds these things in. Other and muscle tissue itself is actually quite fragile. Think about like you cook a steak or whatever, and you know, they, if things, these things fall apart, they're quite delicate, but the fascia is what gives it structure and form and enables the muscle cells which contract, which we'll look at, um, to do their thing. But the fascia is necessary for that. So fascia is one type of connective tissue, and so we'll look at that now. Um, it's composed of fibers, collagen and elastin, and it's got lots of different forms based on kind of what it's composed of. And all the kinds of fascia in the body, they all work together as a system. So it provides a continuum of support that permeates your entire body. So one of the things that we do as anatomists or as students is that we cut the body apart into pieces to take a look at it. And when we do that, we lose sight of the fact that it's actually one continuous whole, right? So it's kind of like problem in your knee. You know, it might be coming from your shoulder or, you know, it's right. So. Totally. So it's very funny. It's like where we feel stuff is, is connected to all the other parts of our body. And fascia, because it is this kind of interpenetrating system of support, links everything together in this way that's really exciting. But again, we used to just toss that out. And now people are like, hmm, maybe this whitish stuff that's connecting everything is actually important. Or maybe, you know, so it's a really cool time to kind of be involved in this. So do you guys want to hear... Um, the nerdy definitions. You want to hear the nerdy definitions of fascia? Yes, let's hear it. Okay. <laughs> I asked a friend of mine. I was like, it's like, give me the nerdy definitions. So I got like an official academic paper um, on this. So the official definition, according to the, I think a, it was like a, a focus group at the fascial conference or something like that. Well, that sounds awesome. Super nerdy. <laughs> I know. Okay. Okay. A fascia. Right? Fascia. Yeah. Oh, the, you guys get the latest news hot off the presses. They do. They do. It's true. No, this is totally from. Okay. I just can't remember exactly if I'm being so accurate about exactly how this paper came about. But a fascia is a sheath, a sheet, 
or any other dissectable aggregations of connective tissue that forms beneath the skin to attach, enclose, and separate muscles and other internal organs. Well, that's the definition. A sheath, a sheet, or any other dissectable <laughs> aggregation of connective tissue or anything else that forms beneath the skin to attach, enclose, and separate muscles and other internal organs. Okay. And this is kind of cool. Listen to this. This is, okay, just take this in. You do not have to remember this or even completely understand it, but this, I think this is a cool one. This is talking about the fascial system. So they also identify the fascial system in the whole body, and they say the fascial system consists of the three-dimensional continuum of soft, collagen-containing, loose and dense, fibrous connective tissues that permeate the body. It incorporates elements such as adipose tissue, that's fatty tissue, adventitiae and neurovascular sheaths, aponeuroses, deep and superficial fascia, epineurium, joint capsules, ligaments, membranes, meninges, fascial system, fas myofascial expansions, periostea, that's what covers your bones, retinacula, these are all different kinds of like fascial things, um, septa, tendons, visceral fascia, and the intramuscular and intermuscular connective tissues, including endoperi epimesium. The fascial system, this is the cool part, the fascial system interpenetrates and surrounds all organs, muscles, bones, and nerve fibers, endowing the body with a functional structure and providing an environment that enables all body systems to operate in an integrated manner. Boom. <laughs> Boom shakalaka. <laughs> right? So, I mean, if we, if we kind of ignore that list of all the stuff, they're basically just listing a whole bunch of stuff in your body. But if we kind of take that list out of it, that the fascial system endows the body with a functional structure and provides an environment that enables all body systems to operate in an integrated manner. So it's the stuff that holds you together and enables everything to work. That's super rad. I, I, I sort of dummy it down in my brain so that I can grasp it, but it's like uh, being in food service for so long, it prevents cross-contamination in your body. That's right. Right? So you're not spewing all You keep that liver separated. <laughs> So, right, it prevents contamination in your body. It prevents these things from slurping into each other, yeah, right? Slurping. slurping, no slurping. You want your intestines to stay your intestines. All right, great. So let's, we're gonna take a look at a couple different layers of fascia, or a couple different specific kinds. And one is called your superficial fascia. This is also called your superficial fat, okay? Um, <clears throat> remember, fat's also a connective tissue. So this is the layer of loose, it's a loose web of fibers that lies actually right underneath your skin and is, and is connected to your skin. You have to separate it with a scalpel and peel it off. And when I did, um, Gil Headley is really into layers of the body. So when you do your dissection with him, first you have, you first, the first day is like take off the skin. And then what's underneath that is this layer of, it looks yellow. When I did it, I did, um, uh, they were embalmed bodies. So like this yellow, I think they would look yellow anyways, but it's this yellow tissue. But what's crazy about your superficial uh, fascia, your fat, is that it's super strong. So it's not just like you got a bunch of fat there. It's interwoven with this collagenous matrix, which is super sturdy. Like it's like chain mail, but soft and fluffy. And, um, and Gil does this thing that he, I think in the last couple of years, he did this process where he actually took that matrix and then people, like he had his assistants like massage it for like hours and they took the fat out. And then they hung it up, sorry if this is a little, yeah, okay. And then they attached it to things like hung weight off of it. And it's so super strong, it's crazy. You can watch videos of this online. He's got tons of free stuff, you can just check it out. So this matrix of fat, we're kind of like, oh my fat. It's like, oh, it's powerful stuff and it transmit, transmits force throughout your body in addition to being storage for, you know, calories and things like that. So this pretty much covers uh, the entire body, your whole of your body, unless you're thin. And it's also inside, like when, I, when we first opened up the chest and looked at the heart, like the heart has fat around it. It's supposed to, it's like the soft and fluffy that keeps everything kind of like, you know, it's nice and snuggly. Gil calls it a fleece. It's like, oh, it's your fleecy layer, right? And we have such a weird relationship to this layer of our body, right, don't we? In our culture with all of our emaciated models or whatever. We have a very strange relationship to it. 
So you can feel it, right? So if you, everyone try this, if you kind of like, we have it, it's thicker in some places. Like obviously if I grab onto my thigh here, I can be like, yeah, it's my superficial, here's my layer, yeah. Here's my layer of superficial fascia. Like I can, I can grab a hunk of that right there. But on, the, on your forearm, right, or the back of your hand, you don't really have a lot of it. So it varies in terms of its thickness in, term, in different parts of your body. So. Uh, so what is our, just like briefly, we'll try not to go down the rabbit hole, but what's our relationship culturally to this layer of our body? I like it's just like, no. I want no fat. No fat. Huh? I just embrace Good. Yeah. Right? But we have, yeah, like what, what, culturally, what are we supposed to be? I saw this picture, and men too. Men are not immune from, even though men have, typically have less of this layer than women, just naturally they're a little, they have less body fat than women do. But I saw this picture, oh, a friend of mine who's a yoga teacher who was putting out a yoga for men thing. Um, and it was about, <clears throat> he put up a picture of like Daniel Craig from the Bond movies, where he's like getting out of the, you know that picture, he's getting out of the ocean, and he's like, or like no body fat or whatever, like probably like 17% body fat or something, 15, I don't know, something silly, where it's like there's this romanticism of like no body fat, right? I don't know. Why don't you guys do this? Get into little, get into small groups, get into pairs. And I just think it's, in, it, it's an important conversation to have to embrace how, how, what is my relationship currently to this? Am I interested in changing that? Can I make an observation? You may. It's not remotely a judgment, so forgive me if it comes across like that, because you have very little body fat. You think that. Right? I have about 27% body fat. Right, so, but that was, the, that was where my point was going to. It's like where the muscle defines <clears throat> for men. So when we look at, like, Daniel Craig, totally shredded, got the washboard going on. Yeah, yeah. That's that attainable thing, which isn't necessarily a lack of body fat, A, it's diet, but yes. it's the gain of muscle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even though you look lean with low body fat, how much muscle is under that? Like, That's a good question. It's such a big thing. Like, it's a huge thing, but the word fat You're is down. so dangerous. Huh? You're down. <laughs> right? No, but she is. She's very lean. Yes, but she is. is it, right? You're very, but is, is it, but like you I'm said, leanish. 27%, right? Yeah, yeah, and which is normal. Totally. Right? Like this is that we think here 27%, we're like, yeah. oh God, like I'm like 27% body fat. Yeah, but the visceral effect is caused by the bones as well. Maybe you yeah. have very thin bones that cause it. You're slender by nature, probably. <laughs> I'm slender by nature totally. and naughty by nature. Hey, that, I knew it was coming. <laughs> naughty by nature. But I, yeah, right. but what is the kind of, <clears throat> but even I, even me, my friends, especially as a young girl growing up. Okay, we're going to get real for a second. I don't know if I, I might cut this from the, I don't know. But let's get real for a sec. Like growing up, I might be slender, but I have this caboose, like I've got a bum on me, right? And when I grew up, I grew up in the 80s, right? In that culture of Jane Fonda and aerobicize and have no curves. Basically be as skinny as possible. And that's, that's healthy, right? You can never be too rich or too thin. And I grew up, I was reading my journals the other day, and I, as a 17 year old, I was writing down how much I needed to diet. When I was in high school, I drank hot water and mustard. Like my friend was like, that's supposed to make you throw up. I was like, even better. Like, it didn't. But, but there was this idea of needing to get, like, being imperfect. And because of my structure, like, I was surrounded by white girls in New Hampshire with, like, no big bums. And I'm like, where did I get this? This is horrible. I'm fat. And so even me, people would look at me and be like, Rachel, you're a skinny bitch, right? And yet, permeating my life was self-loathing for the way that my body looked and a desperate need to diet it away and make it different. And so it's like, if, like it's not, it's, so if I'm experiencing that, what kind of cultural pressure are we under to, to make ourselves different? That's exactly, uh, yeah, and I'm right? emotional because I have, I you feel understand that? that because yeah. I have friends who are, are, are slender by nature and are like, oh, it must be nice. Like, you know what I mean? People yes. Say, but they're like, I'm actually working to build muscle, and she can't build muscle for the life of her just the way she's made. Or like you commented, that people say you're too thin for a man. You know, like, it, it's an interesting thing to... That yeah. is such a... There's a lot there. 
Well, there's so and much judgment. If a so fat much. woman walks in, like I'm a little bit heavier. Oh, you're late. You don't do anything. Right. You're not active enough. That's their mindset. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to register with that. I don't attach to that. I know myself I do it. I'm 56 now, and I'm happy when I am. I'm happy on this. Can't week. believe you're 56. Yeah, I'm 56. I got two adults in their 30s, so. Hell, I'm still going. Well, and that not even to mention, too, like women, moms, when you go through having children, yeah. right? I mean, like your body changes radically. Well, I know. Like, come on. First pregnancy, I wasn't watching it. I thought I could eat two meals a day, like, you know, eat over it, eat a little bit there, get away with it. I was up to 200 pounds. I mean... <clears throat> I couldn't get my shoes on. <laughs> I couldn't see my toes. I didn't know where they were. <laughs> to get my husband to get my shoes on. I mean, yeah. I was a balloon. Yeah. And I had too much salt. I had toxemia. It was a different issue. I was like a bubble. So. I think there's a shift, though. Do you not? Like, I mean, even though I am having a 17 and a 19 year old daughter, like the, the mm. social media side of you know, like we live in this kind of fictitious world and they're constantly seeing and, and striving for, you know, what they see on Instagram and Facebook. And, you know, you constantly have to remind yeah, you're your bombarded kids. bombarded by society. Oh, but I think you're healthy if you're like fit into the Lululemon and nothing's hanging out. The guy with the Lululemon said, oh, that lady should have been wearing my Lululemon because her fat was hanging out or it didn't look good on her. I mean, but if you sit down and I mean, talk with young adults or that swearing out. <laughs> so Don't you worry. To talk with youth or young adults nowadays, I think they're much more confident and able to celebrate and embrace their bodies than say where we were. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I, I find that very hopeful, mm -hmm. and I don't know. Like I don't know, but I, my nieces I know are body conscious. You know. Well, now it's like plastic surgery. My boobs aren't big enough. I need big hips. I need lashes. I need this. the lashes. I, need I know. Yeah. Well, it's the beauty. The beauty industry is an industry that just keeps on giving. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I I think maybe like I think maybe there's also a dichotomy too, where where there is maybe more awareness of that. Like strong is the new sexy. Like I love that. Mm -hmm. That's body conscious. Exactly. You're, you're, you're conscious of what you're trying to do for your vessel to be able to function. And the mindfulness that, that I think help to yeah. be body conscious. Like so, it doesn't body conscious doesn't there's doesn't have to be bad. Yeah. 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 Yes. But I sort of think that there's like one end of the spectrum and the other. So on one hand, we have all this awareness and all this, you know, all body affirming sort of mindset. But on the other hand, we still, you know, we're still seeing like skinny models with big boobs. And, and that sort of, you know, held up as That's oh, a well, these are all, these are all the social woman. media, these are all like social media influencers now. And I'm looking at these girls going, okay, well, they look skinnier than, even than they did in the 70s, but now they have big boobs, big, boobs. big fake boobs. So, yeah, and, and that's sort of still, like, that's still very prevalent. So you, so you sort of yeah, have their, their these two opposing opinions. The yes. <laughs> so what are we supposed to be then? You know, we're talking about how we are, and some of us are satisfied and some of us are not. But if, forgive me if we go back to the caveman that I, I was yesterday, and I think uh, the caveman that I was yesterday was this, you know, the way I am now, because mm -hmm. he went out and ate when he could and didn't when he didn't, you know. When he couldn't, rather. So yeah. I think that we could be anything. And when we could eat a lot, we were bigger. Yeah. So we're, our bodies are adaptable, and that's what you're actually showing us with the fascia. The fascia stretches and it yes. encompasses whatever it gives us, and then the body and it stores the energy. Yeah. For in the days that we are, you know, when we're eating a lot and when we can't eat. What does it do? Well, it, yeah. It replenishes the body when we don't eat <clears throat> This is, and this leads us into, well now the, the challenge is that we live in a segue, but now we live in a culture where food is plentiful and not, we can have as many, ca we could, you could eat a lot of calories a day. So there's, we don't have, unless we decide to fast, we don't have those days where we don't, you know. But I think, I think what, what that brings to mind actually though is, and what you've said, Cher, too, is like, 
And Liz, what, what's our responsibility? Like in terms of, so let's think of ourselves as yoga practitioners and teachers, because when we're teachers, we're taking space. It's like, how do we want to be? And what do we want to, how do we want to participate in this conversation, even if it's implicit in, you know, if you're a yoga teacher, chances are you're going to have a website and an Instagram account at some point, right? It's like, what, how do you want to present yourself out there? How do you want, like, what are the images that you want to provide? Is it like, I'm going to put my, you know, skinny bitch photos up where I look really sleek and I'm wearing my compression Lululemon pants? Or am I going to put those pictures out there where I feel like I'm strong and happy and exactly who I am? What's the images? Like, how do we want to participate in this sort of cultural conversation? And this isn't to answer this now, but it's to, I think it's to make us aware of how we contribute or how we add our voice to that in a way that, you know, reflects our, our deeper values, perhaps, then, because it's, it's tempting out there, right? The things that get liked are often those, like, crazy flexible poses. Those gymnasts, like she was saying in class, and all those yoga teachers who are doing those amazing beautiful backgrounds that have been gymnasts or dancers for 20 years. Yes. That it's not attainable for your that's your right. old yogi that's just starting out. Oh, I just look at those and think, oh, like Ow. she is going to hurt in right? 20 years. <laughs> well, that's. Especially the really young ones that are like yeah. folded in half. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, yeah. Just yeah. I've talked to like physios who work with that population and they're like, they are messed up. Like they're in a lot of pain. I just have, can I say one, yeah. more, little thing? one more thing, Dina? Yes. Um, I think that there's a skewed version of what body shaming is as well in our culture because I think that we celebrate, this has actually happened to my daughter because she's well endowed but quite slender and naturally where she wasn't allowed to wear spaghetti straps at school because she was well endowed, but a heavy set girl was allowed to because she's embracing her body. Oh, that's an interesting double the standard. Interesting double standard. Yeah. So a beautiful, sleek woman who's really lean can't wear a sports bra in class, but the heavier set lady, oh, good for you, all the power to you, or me owning my mohawk. Well done, way to own your gray hair. It's hair, people. Yeah, that's interesting. But it's very interesting. We wouldn't say that to you. Way to own your gray hair. You know what I mean? Like I've got gray hair. I know. It's <laughs> what I mean, though. But we don't, is there such a strange connection to body shaming? Yeah. Wow. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. We're just going to, like, stir up the waters and now continue. All right. So superficial fascia. But, you know, if there's one takeaway from that, it's that superficial fascia. I love, I love the term fleece that Gil uses because it's like, it's like reclaiming something which is really lovely and nourishing to our body. Um, yeah, and there's lots of interesting theories there about how that actually is a transmitter of energy. So, cool. So deep fascia is a thin and fibrous sheet that lays underneath your superficial fascia. So if we stripped all your superficial fascia away, we'd get down to this stuff. And I have to tell you, it's absolutely beautiful. It's so pretty. Have you seen it? Yeah, yeah. It's so pretty. It's like white and iridescent and shiny and it's like all laid out. It's, it's beautiful. And it's like the similar stuff that's made, that creates your tendons and your ligaments too. And so this encases, it's like a body stocking. It's like your personal body stocking that you walk around in that kind of holds everything together. So your IT band, this is a very artificial view of your IT band, but this is what this deep fascia looks like, except for it doesn't end here, it encompasses everything. But what the, what here it's thicker. So your body naturally creates more support where you need it. Like it'll build up bone where you need more bone and it'll, and this becomes quite thick and sturdy because you need support for the outer leg. So the, the fascia here is just thicker, right? But you actually have a saran wrap encasing around your whole thigh, right? Around your body. And then at times it kind of dives in, dives down to the bone. And that's what creates the divisions between your muscles. Right, and so you have this kind of fascia that also encases your muscles. And it's, it's absolutely beautiful. It's really pretty and very slidey. Like it's very kind of sliding and slippery. Um, so what well, you can feel this. So if you come down to the outer leg, you know, you can feel your IT band here. You can feel kind of this hard kind of like, not hard, but really sturdy band here, right? Outside, you guys, who rolls out their IT band? Anyone do it? <laughs> Roll out your idea. You're actually kind of like rolling out. And so rolling it, you're, you're 
kind of getting more into the, when you roll your IT band, you're actually getting into the muscles, obviously, but these things can get stuck to each other. It's not so much that we want to loosen our IT band, but you want to de-adhere it so it's not sticking to stuff that it's not supposed to stick to. I'd say like, right, or what? Oh, yeah, you can't stretch your IT band. Yeah. Muscles around it, or what it attaches to. Yeah, yeah. So we like we like this support. So that's a good. I think that's a good thing for people to understand is that when your body has this kind of connective tissue, it's strappy and strong. It's meant to be strappy and strong, right? Yeah. So it's more the muscles or getting it to slide. Is that? Yeah. So the IT band supports the standing leg, so it helps lock the leg into extension so that you have that extra support so your muscles can relax if they need to. I think of like a horse. You know how horses can sleep standing? Yeah, mm -hmm. which is rad, yeah. I did not know that, but that makes sense. Yeah. So it's like your IT band lets you, gives you that extra support. So we can sleep standing, <laughs> <laughs> potentially. No, that's really cool. I wonder if your alignment was like perfect, maybe. If you could, yeah, <laughs> you could balance. So th these things, uh, so you can see here, there's like the circular thing, and then there's like these diving down to the bones of this kind of like, they're called septa, like the around that hold around the muscle and dive down and hold things together. So another kind of connective tissue proper, tendons. And all this stuff, to me, tendons and ligaments and fascia all kind of looks the same. It's like this white stuff, but tendons. So the way that muscles are created, and we'll look a little bit more in depth at this in, the, in our muscle um, module. But you have this, this should actually be white. The covering of this should be white. But you can see like each muscle fiber gets surrounded by fascia. That gets surrounded by fascia. That whole thing gets surrounded by fascia. This gets surrounded by fascia. And so what happens is as you go down here um, and the muscle starts to peter out, actually, then all that's left is the fascia, the connective tissue. And so then you have the connective tissue, which connects the muscle tissue into the bone, but it's not like you have a muscle and then you have a tendon stuck to it and then you've got a bone, which is kind of what we think. When you think, oh, a tendon connects a muscle to a bone, you think, oh, well, there's something in between there. But actually, the tendon is continuous with the fascia that is surrounding and encasing the muscle sheaths, or the muscles, the muscle fibers. And then, so it's all kind of like <laughs> slurping into one thing, but we call that a tendon. We name it a tendon. Make sense? Yes, okay. So uh, you can see your tendon so, and feel them. So the Achilles tendon is one that's quite superficial. Right? So you want to grab onto this. It feels very right, hard, right? Oof. Maybe tight, right? You can also see the tendons on the top of your feet, right? So these, this is not a bone. This is a tendon that, that runs up to, I think it's your tib anterior right here tendon, right? So you can actually see them, your hands, you can see the tendons in your hands too, if you wiggle your fingers around. So if we could just ask Lucky about the tendons and stretching, so can we stretch any of them then? They, they're all the same length and they don't change. You don't, you don't want to stretch tendons, you want to stretch the muscle. That. But you can load tendons. You can we, load. Can, we can talk about oh, sorry. Sorry. I No, it's a great, no, it's a good drops. question. Feel like a stretch in a hamstring, you don't want to feel it like at your sit bone. Yeah. You want to feel it in like the belly of the muscle, or you want to feel it behind your knee. You want to feel it in the middle of the muscle. Right. So if you feel, and it's not a nice pulp, like it's like almost an ouchy kind of hurts kind of pulp. I think that's, no, I think this is a great point to make is that connective tissue in general, we don't want to like pull it apart. Um, and so to hear this, I just want to repeat it because it's so, it's such a great point and I want to make sure that it's picked up for posterity, <laughs> but it's not to stretch your tendon so that if you're feeling a stretch, you want to feel it in the muscle belly, right? And not actually stretch the connective tissue because that weakens it. So yeah, that's awesome. And in yoga, just like you said, pointed out the hamstrings, that's a very common injury is for people to get like a pull. I've totally pulled both of mine right at the attachments. Yay! <laughs> no, not yay. No, 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 not yay. Um, yeah, in a, I remember the class well in which I did it. But so, t as a cautionary tale, that not to um, maybe glamorize 
over stretching the backs of the legs because in yoga we do so many forward folds don't we we do so much of that kind of stuff and one of the things about your dual actions inner thighs back which helps to create more space for people but the tailbone down helps to create a little bit of activation so if you have flexible people like i always am lengthening my sitting bones down when i do forward folds exactly to try to avoid overstretching the attachments yeah jen yeah and i just want to highlight the point too that i think <clears throat> when we teach a public class the masses tend to be tight versus overly flexible and i think yeah i've experienced this myself what can often happen is our cueing lends more toward getting as deep as possible in the postures versus the, there's there's little done that i see done well that actually speaks to not overdoing it so those people who tend to be a little bit more naturally hypermobile don't have the awareness of where to back off or stop and like remain engaged versus just like going as deep as possible because that's what most of our cues lend themselves to. And then those are the people who end up with tendon injuries because they just stretch way past their natural range of motion. Yes. Right? Such a good point. Yeah, so is. I guess and the reason I'm bringing this up is for you to maybe highlight better for everybody like where do you draw the line and what are this what are some maybe specifics that you would be cautious of your language about going too far yeah yeah well i mean i think this is why the dual actions are so important and why you know because when we hear take a wide-legged forward fold everybody and then you have people who turn their toes in like teachers will default to say turn your toes in that's getting inner thighs back that's like widening and spreading the sitting bones to help people who are naturally tight so i i don't do that i'm like your feet are parallel and then individually if i want to say hey dude you're super tight does it help you to take your heels wide or do you find more space but i'll always cue both right so i'll always say not just inner thighs back but my flexible people i said it in class yesterday i'm like take your sitting bones down to you know to gather that so i think I think doing best practices and teaching to, even though we're teaching to the majority of the room, it's like to address those people and to create stabilizing cues that help people to not only find the space of yoga, but also the stability. Because just like you say, like a lot of people too will come to yoga because, oh, I'm tight. But people come to yoga too because they feel like they're good at it because they're flexible. Mm -hmm. And so then we just are increasing their flexibility without stabilizing them. And I would say like, contraction too like if you're stretching your hamstrings contract your quads because that's an automatic protection like it'll help you protect your tendons that's good i actually didn't know that that yeah. if you if you engage your quads it protects your hamstring tendons yeah i did not know so that when you're in forward fold if you contract your quads it'll just take that pressure out of the tendons in your hamstrings cool if you're doing a deadlift a classic yeah. deadlift if you don't fire up the glutes it's all hamstrings and that's how you tear your hamstrings doing a heavy deadlift hmm even in warrior is a one where you're planting your back foot. Like I've seen people actually like, like because this. it requires such flexibility and that part of the foot and, and it's like, ow, and they, you know, they've completely overstretched, mm. you know, so just little, like, it's just amazing. I think people don't think that they can hurt themselves in yoga. They oh, they can. Oh, yeah. right? oh yes, they can. Yeah. Okay, let's move on from this. This is a great conversation. Um, so tendons, let's talk about ligaments real quick because this is similar. Ligaments are connective tissue. Again, beautiful. So pretty, 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 pretty. And they connect bone to bone. So a tendon's function is connecting muscle to bone. A ligament's function is connecting bone to bone. And it's just like, it's like packing tape inside your body, right? It's just like strapping your bones together. So across your sacrum, you've got tons of these guys <laughs> slathering your SI joint, which is a joint of stability, not so much of the mobility, right? So, and it, it, it looks like this. It's white and iridescent and so pretty. And when I look at tendons, like I pulled the foot apart and looked at tendons and oh, it's like, they're so, it's, just like so pretty you're so pretty you have little rainbows inside of you it's so nice all right so but we notice that this connective tissue um to lucky's point too it's whitish right so what does a tissue that's whitish in your body mean not as much blood flow not as much blood flow that means it doesn't have remember your bones remember how red and juicy those were right okay this guy this stuff is whitish as opposed to your muscles which are red Right, so if something doesn't have good blood flow, what does that mean about healing it? it takes for freaking ever. I still feel my hamstring injuries, and I did them in 2002. Well, that's a different thing. That's like, that's the pressure squeezing the blood out, but my toes could be filled with blood. So they would heal 
Like if I, a muscle, if a muscle is red, um, like if I tore a muscle, for example, that has good blood flow in general, um, and that'll heal more easily than say if I hurt a tendon or I sprained my ankle, because those are whitish tissues and they don't get as much. But yes, you're right, when you press your toes down, when you squeeze the blood out of them, you can see that, or pressing your fingertips, yeah, let's say you, do you can see that they're rooted. <laughs> I always think people can get a little too intense about that though. So connective tissue, can, any questions about the difference between tendons, ligaments, fascia? deep fascia, superficial fascia, just that we've basically just taken a little stroll through some different kinds of connective tissue. All right, so let's think about some, some issues with connective tissue. So just like we were talking about, connective tissue doesn't heal so easily. So if you have a ligament, for example, your ligaments act a little bit more like plastic than elastic. So you know how a rubber band bounces back? That's not like your connective tissue. So if I have a ligament that's, you know, connecting my outer ankle, you've got all these ligaments here, and you pull them apart, right, it's like a plastic bag. You stretch it, it doesn't go back. Has anyone sprained their ankle? Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's many faces. And has it healed? Uh, yeah. You think it does. Yes. But then, it again. suddenly when you're sprinting across the street to get your dog, like a, with me, I sprained my right ankle so badly a couple of times, like just playing basketball years ago. Yeah. And even now, many, many, many years later, when I make a sudden movement, I'll feel a quick stab of pain right in there. So I, I it's probably healed, but yes. I don't know what that's about. Yes. Well, and they'll, they maybe they reconnect, but they're longer or lengthened or not as stable as they were. Just like Lucky said, like the tendons, they get weaker when you injure them. So I imagine it's the same for ligaments too, once you injure it. Yeah, they overstretch. So once they've overstretched, you have to strengthen. That's the only thing you can do, strengthen the yeah. muscles of that foot. Yeah. And I mean, I sprained my ankle and I feel like the stability is gone. And now if my ankle does something that historically would have been the sprain, now, now it's like, you're like, whoa, that's not good. But no, right. It's hard done because because it's already broken. <laughs> well, and it's, and it's um, so you strengthen the, because you can, it depends on the tear too, right? So yeah. If it's a full tear, then that's not coming back. Yeah. Then you, well, what, you won't have stability. So if you have a ligament in your ankles that are torn, that's probably why you have that. Um, whereas like a grade one spring you have up there, you'll get scar tissue that fills that in. Mm -hmm but it still changes the consistency of that ligament. Yeah, the way that it moves. Because scar tissue, correct, please correct me if I'm wrong, but scar tissue sort of throws down haphazardly rather than in the nice line that the ligament does. So it's like, it's like Spider-Man splooging something. Yeah. You know, you're like, yay, we fixed it. But it's totally screwed up. That's why you have to like rub things, like make them try to make the fibers line up more. So, yeah. yeah. So why do they say they want to break down scar tissue? Like, isn't it serving a purpose then? <clears throat> Oh. Well, for, kind of for that purpose, to, because, it, because it's like a big, it's like throwing a big cobweb right. on something that's in all different directions, so you break it down to smooth it out and get everything to kind of line up in the line of pull, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So it's more I functional. <laughs> She's such a nerd. <laughs> well, yes, clearly, right? Okay. So those are sprains. Hypermobility is an interesting thing. Now, hypermobility is not an injury. Everybody, let's keep in mind, hypermobility is not an injury. But people genetically have different levels of laxity in their connective tissue. Some people will have, you know, super flexy connective tissue, and some people will have, like, be tight and more, like, bound up. So, um, so it's caused by hypermobility in a joint is caused by the shape of the joint. Hypermobility um, in a joint basically means you can take it back past 180 degrees, which a lot of people can. It's like... It's not, it's not, it doesn't make you weird, um, but that can be caused by the shape of the joint, but also by the laxity or non-laxity of the joint capsule and the connective tissues around it. So, I mean, and it's kind of like in yoga, we want to have a balance between stability and mobility. So this comes back to our hyperflexible students. I have a lot of students in Vancouver, you know, or, you know, I'll have people come into class who are super flexible and they love being able to do yoga because they can like put their foot behind their head, it's no big deal, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, we're gonna make you hold plank <laughs> and warrior two for a long time because you need more stability. Like what yoga seeks to do actually, in my mind, is create more functionality and more balance in the body. So my tight guys, yeah, we're gonna stretch you out. This is part of the dual actions, right? You guys need more space 
but you guys over here need more stability, which is why we have the paired actions can be really useful in helping to address um, a broad range of students. So hypermobility can be natural, but when we take a joint uh, past its range of motion and just sit in it, so you know people lock out their joints, then to my mind that's creating a, that's not the most functional, that's not doing your students the most functional service because I want those students to get stronger. I don't want them to sit in their joints and, and, and add a, a stretch, a tensile stretch to that connective tissue and potentially stretch it out longer. Like I don't want them to pull on their plastic bag. Their plastic bag is loose enough. Instead, we want to stabilize around the joints. So creating more muscle tone um, around that joint so that it is protected and functional, right? And also hypermobility, like and we'll talk about this more when we do knees, but it's, it creates a chain reaction up the body which can disengage your muscles and and cause stresses which aren't particularly good or useful for you. So in this particular slide you can see that she is locking out her knee and she's hypermobile. What often will happen in this pose is that the quad will completely disengage and so there's no like talk about like overstretching your hamstrings too like there's no protection for that joint and then she's kind of sitting in the knee and sitting in the joint capsule and that's not you know, some people argue that that can be useful sometimes, but I am more of a mind of, no, like let's engage the muscles around the joint and strengthen them. Especially because we do a lot of these actions like so repetitively, right? Mm -hmm. So if maybe doing it once, it's yes. a hundred times over, it's definitely not, right? Yeah, most yoga injuries are, are chronic injuries, like repetitive stress injuries. You don't come in and like hit, knock yourself out. What happens is that over time, over five to 10 years of practice, all of a sudden you're like, why is this not working anymore? <laughs> so um, that happened to me where I took a year off of practicing yoga to basically go to the gym and do squats because my hamstrings were so long and my glutes were weak and I couldn't like sprint. And I was like, this is no good. I was playing touch football with my family and re-injured my hamstring because I didn't have enough stability. And I said, well, forget this. So I took a year off, I was like, teaching yoga full time or whatever. I was like, nope, took a year off, still taught, but took a year off of my yoga practice basically and did a lot of squats and went for jogs and like rebuilt the dynamic strength of my body. And then when I practiced yoga, then it was so much better. I was like, oh, now I actually feel my hamstring stretching because there's actually something there, <laughs> right? And then I, was, I could be like, go out and sprint and not hurt myself, which is much more functional. Um, so the yoga practice is really cool because it does offer mobility and like lots of joint movements. It's like we move our joints in all directions and that's one of its secret spices. That's one of the magical things about the yoga practice. But hypermobile students, if they're already mobile, they might be um, doing themselves a disservice by not working on the stability. So problems usually happen like you get gymnasts and contortionists like we were talking about the Cirque du Soleil folks, right? And, and dancers, ballerinas who are hypermobile. Um, they can get away with that for a while because they're so darn strong. But what happens, like one of my physio friends was telling me, maybe like he can speak to this too, is that when they are not in training anymore and when they don't have the strength around their joints and they're super hypermobile, then they start to fall apart later. Because, you know, they're crazy strong now, but you stop that training and all of a sudden, like, rest, yeah. yeah, everything starts to kind of catch up. So, yeah. Now, interesting. <laughs> All right, so find out, are you hypermobile? So let's do a little experiment. I know, <laughs> what's happening? So there are different tests that you can do. So you can extend your arms, if you extend your arms out. So we'll get into partners and do this so you can look at each other. And you can see if this joint goes beyond 180 degrees. That's one way to just check. Um, another way is to try to lock your knee. I'm not hypermobile in my knees. So, but if your knee kind of, bows back like so and you can lock the joint out beyond 180 degrees that's an indication of hypermobility this see i'm so not hypermobile this is a indication of hypermobility so get, why don't you get with your get with a partner or a group of three and just take a look at your elbows and your knees and your thumb just as a kind of quick way to check out your own mobility <clears throat> hanging out in plank pose i just always make them bend their elbows <laughs> Just slightly, just a little. And all of a sudden everything has to, the muscles have to work to stabilize. And then that girl in that picture, would, would you as an instructor come up and cue her to soften that knee or you allow her to keep staying her hypermobility? I would make her bend her knee. And come out of it, right? That, would, that just makes me want to fall on my back. 
Yes, well now we're going to talk about exactly that. So what do you do? How do we support our hypermobile students? And this is the thing is that we don't want to, I know, isn't that crazy? We don't want to villainize hypermobility. It's not that hypermobility is bad, it's totally normal. But we do want people to find more balance. So if they're stiff, we want them to, we want to help them with their mobility. And if they're hypermobile, we want to help them with their stability. That's all. Well, right? Just to create an awareness of it, so it might be worth mentioning in a class, like once we all have kind of more experience and are comfortable doing that. Because I think some people just aren't aware of it. Yes. Absolutely. Or ask that student if they're okay. Can I use you as an example in class of this is what hypermobility looks like? May not be attainable for everyone's body. So, oh, yeah. Do you know what I mean? I see it, and because you are. Are you hypermobile? Oh, it's not where you were. So, I think this comes back to, like, it's not even skeletal variation. It's like body variation, right? So it's just human variation. Is to is to remind our students that it's about it's about making their own body more functional. It's get it's not doing the Instagram version of full splits because that's gonna be because that's the end goal. That actually the end goal of yoga is something which is much more interesting, which is like functional strength and mobility and health. Like really, that's it. That's the goal. <laughs> so that we can sit and meditate and have peaceful minds. <laughs> really, if that is the bigger goal. So if you have a hypermobile student in class, it's, we're thinking about like, what are some of the things that you might say? So rather than, rather than actually discuss it as a group, I'd like you guys to get into your groups and think about like, okay, so what would you tell like this student? Or what would you tell the class? Talk in your small groups, talk in your small groups. I want you guys to brainstorm together. What would you do? How would you address this in yoga class?